You look amazing. A rainbowy, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I don't have headphones with me. Mate, your your face is on Zoom. That's all we need. All right. Well, thank you. I finally my face finally got here. Um, <laughs> and I'll turn off anything I can, basically. Just don't turn off Zoom, yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> well, it's so good to meet you. Yeah. So thank you so much. So this is for a a, a fundraiser for Yoga Stops Traffic, and that is a charitable organisation that is helping rescue and re rehabilitate women and children from slavery, trafficking, and child marriages. So and where all over in, or in India specifically. Um, and you work with it or you're just doing this for it? Yeah, they approached me because I teach <laughs> chakra yoga raves. <laughs> you know that really traditional yogic vibe? Yeah. yeah. I think I read it in the third section of the yoga sutras, right? There you are, mate. Yeah. yeah. And basically, they approached me to do a, a one-off rave for them to raise money. And I was like, do you know what? I can probably go a little bit better than that, mate. We can probably do your whole festival with 108 workshops and all sorts of lovely interviews and talks and things. Wow, look at you. So, well, in for a penny, in for a pound, you know, get in. Yeah, but that's, uh, that's a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, good work, work for a good thing, but good for you. Not everyone would do that. Very few people would do that. Well, more people should bloody well do it. <laughs> Exactly. So hopefully we'll inspire people. <laughs> exactly. You've created Elephant Journal. Was that in 2002? Yes, 2002. It's a bloody long time ago, isn't it, mate? Um... I know. <laughs> Facebook was invented then, you know? YouTube was like, I don't even know if YouTube was around. It's a different time. It was one of the first publications that I came across that was spiritual, that wasn't absolutely wafty and stuck it head up its own arsena and very informative there was a lot of joy on there a lot of um connection it's just a really beautiful community that you've created so well done man that must have been a lot of work thank you yeah it still is and uh i don't i feel like we're only 10 percent there at most right yeah thanks for doing it all because it's absolutely wonderful and i particularly enjoy the uh conscious consumerism the fact that there's an alternative, like some people would say, you know, that's not necessarily the answer, but at least it's a way from absolutely smashing the planet to pieces. We kind of don't need very much stuff, but we, we live in a world where we do need stuff. I think that's part of conscious consumerism is by, you know, resisting the urge to buy. Like I haven't owned a car for, you know, um, really 18 years, I think as long as elephant and, or maybe 17 or, Anyway, I still have this urge every year to buy a car. Every year, every day. Maybe not every day, but every month, you know? And I think we're like trained from birth to like buy a Wrangler, buy a thing, but you know, have a car. It's part of your identity. Yeah. So yeah, I do think minimal, minimalism and buying less and is part of conscious consumerism for sure. Andrew Seeley introduced us. Thanks to, thanks to Andrew. I spoke to him for a little while. I'm guessing you guys are buddies. Yeah, uh, I don't see him enough. He's wonderful. He's a bright light. He really is, yeah. This little chat that I wanted to have with you, I just wanted to have a couple, cover a couple of things, which is inclusivity and wellness, um, and uh, the sort of demise of the guru, and something we've just touched on already, which yes. is like non wafty BS in, in, in spiritual world, you know, just keeping it real, keeping it accessible. Yeah that kind of vibe. So in yeah, our section, our spirituality section, and even the word spirituality doesn't quite fit what we're trying to cover, but it's always from the begin beginning been called, as you, it sounds like you noticed, non-New Age spirituality <laughs> for a reason, you know. Yeah. We're not here to, um, a lot of spirituality is, again, like you just brought up, con consumerism is intimately tied in with capitalism or consumerism. I think there's a reason yoga is so popular, but meditation isn't. It's really hard to market products to meditators. Like, what do you need? You don't need anything. You don't even need an outfit, you know? <laughs> and uh, non-New Age, meaning, you know, a lot of spirituality on the other hand, uh, capitalism or consumerism on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's, uh, it's about pleasure and it's about um, trying to get rid of suffering, which is in attitude that is the opposite of the Buddhism that I grew up in and, and is the opposite of inclusivity and the opposite of equity.
is I want pleasure and I want to push away anything troubling like homeless people or elderly people or sick people or, you know, literally that's the opposite of the Buddha's story. If you know the story of the Buddha. Yeah. Your ideals and values are absolutely everything that sort of aligns with what we do, obviously give the non-plastic aspect, which is totally heartsy vibes on that. Um, I run a real festival in real life. This isn't real life. Um, and I've had it at a plastic free site for the last five years. And when I told oh. them that, they were like, what are you doing? You can't have no plastic. And I was like, yeah. well, I can. <laughs> and we will. Yeah. Good for you. So it's really it's hard. So it? It's a hard, hard thing. It is hard, but it's also kind of fun. And it's, um, it's a lot harder when you think about, um, uh, you know, that our oceans are, I, maybe you know the stat better than me, but are on the verge of having more plastic than fish, that yeah. we're ingesting a credit card a week of worth of plastic, maybe it's a month, um, I'm still drinking my coffee, but in any case, I think it's every week, and, um, you know, it's in the blood of newborns because of the milk from the mom. I mean, plastic is forever. And when it breaks down, it's even worse. It's in the fish, it's in the birds, it's in the whales. The whales will eat it. The bears locally where I live eat it and from the trash and um, they think they're full. They don't get hungry. So then they starve to death. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. In India, the cows eat the plastic on, you know, 10 years ago when I first started going to India, the cows were eating the plastic on the floor there. Um, absolutely tragic. And now there's studies being done about how much plastic is in the air. There's there's actually plastic yep. in the air. Is yes, it? in the dust. How on earth is it still legal? But it, but it is. Um, so exactly. I'm glad. Well, I think within our lifetime, and hopefully sooner um, than you know, the end of our all of our lives, we'll actually have alternatives that are affordable and you know make certain you know single use plastic should be illegal. I think plastic can be fine in certain. Uh, you know, for certain, those who need it or uh, for medical uses or, you know, mm. but hemp plastic, like if you drive the BMW i3 or whatever it is, the whole dashboard, the whole interior is hemp plastic, not plastic. And it's just, you wouldn't even know. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. There's definitely alternatives out there and hemp seems to be an alternative for lots of things. Actually, it's a, it's a miraculous plant. When, when COVID hit the fan, did you see extra sort of subscription or um, activity on the Elephant Journal page or was it always pretty steady? Yeah, our, we're funny because we're this sort of hybrid model between a publication where it's sort of top down and people will submit articles and we consider them, our editors, and then maybe they get published. And this sort of Reddit model where people just contribute and we're kind of almost more that model these days where we're reader driven. So in a very organic way, as soon as quarantine hit and COVID hit, articles started popping up. Um, and at first there was a brief moment of beyond the fear, there was a brief moment of like fun. People were talking about recipes and what do you do home alone for a month with your family and your kids? and you know, this was before it kind of got politicized, whether or not to wear a mask. And um, and from the beginning, we had articles that connected equity and COVID because that's a glaring uh, aspect of any challenging times is it hits yuppies emotionally and practically, and it hits those without means or those essential workers or those whose our jobs are lost it hits them brutally and from top down mm -hmm. and um so yeah we were all over it and uh we started i started a gathering a weekly gathering kind of like this um and but we invited our readers and it grew uh pretty huge we put it out on live you know facebook live and instagram live and as well as just within our own site and I invited some guests on, but mostly it was just me and the community just hanging out That's and nice. talking about Dharma and Buddhism and how to cope with this and just sort of talking. It was almost like we were all starving for community. 
yeah some sort of connection and uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure I wondered whether there were any sort of articles or submissions that really stood out for you that were either really moving or hilarious or bizarre yeah I mean we definitely had all of the above um, I just asked an editor to send all of her favorites uh, to me but um, <laughs> come back to that you know there's a couple that just communicate a lot in the titles COVID and new age narcissism COVID and spiritual bypassing um, there's a ton here about the other subject we'll get to um, but uh, yeah thoughts from a pissed off mom there's a lot about um, you know like everyone in America there was a lot of people discovering new hobbies and new skills and trying to bake bread for the first time and you know a lot of that was a common experience but also wonderful because on some level we are our mission is about the mindful life so you know a lot of the plastic a lot of the speediness a lot of the consumerism comes from food companies and corporations having captured our attention as michael pollan who i got to interview years ago said if you've seen the food or drink advertised don't eat it meaning you want something that hasn't isn't a product you want something that actually is what it is mm -hmm. and that doesn't have to be expensive like my mom we grew up on like i remember we we're i grew up pretty poor with a single mom and sometimes we would just live on rice and popcorn for like a month solid and it sounds awful but uh and i'm sure in some ways it's probably not a healthy diet but um you know, we had a wonderful home life and she was a wonderful, loving mom. And you can buy very simple stuff in bulk. And, you know, we had a lot of blogs about that, how to feed yourself, how not to hoard. There was a lot of this hoarding going on. We were kind of anti-hoarding, but at the same time, be prepared. There's a middle way. That's what the Buddha talks about all the time. So I talked about how you can buy galvanized steel tins, like uh, trash bins, and then you can buy bulk in paper bulk bag of rice, bulk bag of lentils, bulk bag of whatever, you get a discount from the grocery store when you call them up and order a bulk bag, almost always a 15%. And then you fill it up and then you, you kind of, you're set, like your panic. In the beginning, everyone was scared of not having food or toilet paper or whatever. So we were like pro, what do you call them? Uh, the, instead of toilet paper of the day. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, just like, we don't have to freak out. And we also have to be prepared yeah. and we don't want to, the freaking out is this sort of quality of like F my neighbors, F society. I got mine. I want mine. I want an underground bunker with guns. You know, it's very anti equity really. So and it's very fear and uh, aggression based, which is very American right now. It's quite a lot all over the world, to be honest. Um, right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you see that with Brexit. But. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's just happened. So, yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. That's an extra thing to uh, to swallow during COVID. <laughs> yeah. And it never works out. I mean, you see that with Brexit. Is you know, there's a middle path where you do want to protect your own farmers or your own merchants. But you know, I'm just got done reading Obama's book and then Bill Clinton's a book about Bill Clinton, you know, the good and the bad. And Clinton talked a lot about like globalization was just starting in the nineties. We have to be open. You could talk about this spiritually. So it's not too off the subject. We have to be open, but at the same time, you don't want to be just, you know, a sucker or just used by people who don't have a good intention. So how do you be strong, but open? Yeah yeah some boundaries and uh not yeah. completely leaving an entire continent <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's how i would moot the idea anyway <laughs> i'm voting for you <laughs> thanks <laughs> oh brilliant so equality and wellness so something yeah. i've noticed since i've been putting on wellness events um and that was highlighted during covid was the whitewash that I am always presented with in so many ways both with applications and then um, so I run events and things and um, when I look at other events online so you see the lineup 
the first thing that I notice now nowadays, especially since Black Lives Matter, is how many uh, what's the variant of of ethnicity, age, size, male to female, trans. Do you know what I mean? Like age, yeah, yeah, age exactly. And it's and it's it's really hard because I have to actively seek <laughs> different people to represent. You know, because it's yeah. it is what I've experienced, despite it coming from Asia. Uh, you know, a lot of these um, ideologies and practices, it's it's now very sort of white, middle class, skinny, young and female. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so I didn't know whether you had A, noticed that, B, whether there's any steps that you guys can or have taken or if there's anything that, I don't know, because it is, it's a really tricky and odd subject. Yeah, I think, you know, there's dueling impulses right now. There's the sort of like, Twitter um, attitude around equity, which is like, let's call people out and let's destroy people if they're not good, which is good on some level. It's, it, it, it equalizes the power, you know, um, like the Me Too movement. It, it becomes really easy as we're seeing right now with Governor Andrew Cuomo to anyone who's on high, who's powerful, you can call them to the mat. But there's an aggression in it that it's good in the beginning, but then we need, um, we also need to encourage people in positions of any kind of responsibility. Like I wouldn't say you have a position of power, but you have a position of responsibility to reach out beyond the communities you may know and try to have a festival that represents many different communities and, and people from different backgrounds, as do we. And that's an awkward process. It's scary. And we need to have space for that awkward process and not attack you the entire time. Mm -hmm. So I recently, I, um, I'm totally going through this and I have forever. I mean, we were, we have like a 95% female staff, including positions of power, but historically our diversity has been pretty weak. We're based in Boulder, Colorado, one of the whitest towns in the U S like is very much like Bernie Sanders is Vermont and Bernie Sanders's campaigns went through the same thing. They're all for equity, 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 equity. But then they look at their, particularly in one of his earlier campaigns, look at his campaign staff and it's like all white yeah. and mostly male. So there's some level of you have to reach beyond your choir. And luckily that's elephant's mission. So in some ways we have advantages. Our mission from the beginning was to share the good news about the mindful life beyond the choir to all those who might give a care. So, um, you know, our writers are actually far more diverse racially than our staff, mm -hmm. which is helpful in a way because we have a lot of people who we know who we can reach out to and ask dumb, awkward questions. But there needs to be space for that dumb, awkward question in society. You know, so when we're looking for a new hire, an editor, I will reach out and explicitly say, I don't know how to say this, but 95% of the applications for jobs at Elephant Journal are, uh, come from, you know, white, sometimes Jewish, uh, you know, 25 to 40 year old women. And while I'm proud of our strong, um, you know, kick-ass uh, female staff members, um, we would, you know, we have, on a staff of 30, we, I think we have five uh, folks who are of color. Right. And that's not awful. It's mm -hmm. not 30 white people, but, you know, there needs to be representation of our readership and of our morals, and not just in a tokenism way. Mm -hmm. um, but that part I'm not really afraid of because frankly, everyone who applies at Elephant is kind of amazing. You don't apply to Elephant or, you know, to a festival unless you're drawn to that thing usually. So we're not getting applications off of LinkedIn. We're mm -hmm. getting applications from people who are steeped in the community and in the mission. So um, anyway, it is hard. And I, I think, you know, we have to, as, as, Congressman John Lewis, who you may or may not know about, there's a narcissism to America where we think everyone knows everyone American, but Congressman John Lewis was like Martin Luther King Jr. He was this hero in 
civil rights. And whenever his fellow um, constituents or colleagues of color would say, things are awful and they're not getting better and this is bullshit, he would say, you're right, things are not good enough, but let me tell you how much better they are in just one generation. And that's not because people sat on their hands and did nothing. It's because people uh, like you and me forced change. We made change. So I do think there's a combination of we are making change and we need room for that change to be awkward and vulnerable. And, you know, hi, I'm a white guy trying to hire, trying, hoping to work with people who aren't white. That's awkward to say publicly and I could be attacked and I would probably deserve it. Um, but at the same time, you know, otherwise I just keep hiring white people. Just the people that are there, I guess. It's kind of hard. Yeah, because everyone has their silo and you got to get out of the silo. Yeah, but at least, I mean, the diversity I think is is important both in the team, but but very, very much so in who submits, you know, to write and then the readership. So, yeah. you know, if you've got two out of three going on, and you know geographical situation is is a constraint you can't you know necessarily yeah. we're in a predominantly white area yeah that's just where you are mate you know yeah and it's really hard because you know you talk about systemic racism it's not just that you need to appeal in boulder outside of the folks you know i actually have a really diverse uh group of friends um but Boulder is really, really expensive. So there's this like systemic nature to the bubble that is Boulder where it's really expensive. So anyone who makes less than whatever, $75,000 uh, in US would realistically struggle to live in Boulder at this point. Um, the housing is so, it doubled in just five years, 10 years ago when half of like Silicon Valley moved here. Um, we're going through that sort of California tech exodus where Boulder was this cute little town and it was affluent, but it was completely, you could totally find a cool situation to live in. It was kind of known for hippies. And, you know, my mom was a total hippie and Buddhist and my dad was a hippie. They were broke. My dad, I think paid $30 a month for his rental at the time. And obviously there's inflation, but now it's like, you know, a little crappy cottage somewhere costs a million dollars. I mean, it's so, you know, people of any color, people of any background would struggle to live here unless they have mommy and daddy or, you know, some sort of help. Yeah. If they're just moving here and they're young, particularly. So, yeah, that's definitely another um, ex exclusive factor, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. So at least, uh, yeah, I was, I was hoping for a great answer and I got one. So thanks. <laughs> well, generous. Yeah. I mean, I think none of this is that sexy or self-righteous to talk about, but it's good for us to, you know, look at the facts. And so, you know, I'm part of this affordable housing movement here in Boulder. I'm not a very helpful part, but I'm, I'm supporting them. There's a lot of people doing a lot more than me, but, um, you know, it's urgent and it's sort of hopeless. Like all of us feel like it's hopeless, but we're still trying. At least you're doing something, man. That energy's going somewhere, isn't it? So yeah. yeah. Well, like in Boulder, I mean, this is not what you want to talk about, but in Boulder, we have a legal limit. I think it's like three people who are unrelated maximum can live together in a house. So you could have a six bedroom house. You're only allowed to have three people live in it. Because we don't want these rowdy, what's that? Such an arbitrary rule. It is, and it's incredibly classist. So, you know, if you're not rich and you want to make Boulder work, you're going to find a big old house and you're going to have like 12 roommates or 10 roommates. You're going to create a co-op, but that's illegal. Wow, man. So like so communities are illegal. Any co-op community? There are, there are like four or five co-ops, but that's in a town of, you know, hundreds hundred plus thousand people. So we're basically trying to expand the, the process for applying to create a co-op to anyone. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a really good look. Keep on, keep yeah. on train. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Man. <laughs> 
That is, that is actually really interesting to me because I used to lawyer around the place. I worked for um, an American firm at one point, Giuliani. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. hopefully in a prior incarnation. He was never great, but he was at least in some ways not batshit crazy. I mean, I mean, kind of actually crazy, but also um, for me, it was just a job. It was just interesting because that sort of thing that you just talked about really interests me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's what it takes. I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of, a lot of us, again, with that sort of Twitter aspect of equity, want to posture and take positions. And there's an extremism to our positions because we aren't actually doing anything. You know, we're saying justice for Breonna Taylor now. That's good. But what are you actually doing? Yeah. And when you get to down to brass tacks, it is in boring things like going to a city council meeting and advocating for, you know, uh, uh, an exclusive town to start being inclusive. Yeah. And it's really hard, arduous, um, laborious, admin <laughs> and energy expenditure. You know, and, you know, people say, like you say, they support something, but actually doing it is an entirely different thing. Like even putting on this festival, it's like, you know, 14 hours a day for many, many weeks. But I'm interested and I like it and I care. So if you give a shit, you're yeah. going to do some shit, basically. Well, that's another one of our focuses at Elephant is Right Livelihood, which is not doing what you love, doing what's of benefit to others, doing what hopefully can pay the bills for you because it needs to not just be an idealistic thing, but sustainable and doing um, what you're good at. So it's mm -hmm. all four things. And um, sounds like you're doing a lot of that. <laughs> trying, yeah, trying to pay the bills anyway. We'll see about that. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that part, but. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. <laughs> something always happens. Something always comes along. It's cool. Yeah, I mean, it can lead to that. It doesn't have to be profitable right away. I mean, I worked, I had two different, rounds with elephant where I was sleeping on couches and eating day old muffins, which to this day caused me like PTSD when I'm around them. Really? Like, well, I lived, can you imagine living on high fiber muffins that are day old for, I mean, that's what I lived on. Mate, your diets in the past, I, I'm going to come and cook you some food. <laughs> okay. Yeah, <please. laughs> You're going to do a month with Ray Ray. <laughs> I, yeah. Please. I'm good now. Okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, you said earlier something about meditation that really tickled me, like you can't um, make a product out of it to sell it. And, you know, that is madness, isn't it? That is basically what the hot, what yoga, I'm a, I teach yoga for my sins. Um, I don't like admitting it, but I do. Um, and basically, yeah, what you can sell in yoga, although meditation is yoga, it's, it's, yeah. it's this stupid division and like little compartmentalization so that yeah. they can sell different bits um yep. and yet like you say it, it can't be sexy or you can't have an outfit for it and it's like you know how do you take a photo for instagram of internal peace right <laughs> and that's yeah i mean yo exactly I, i've actually written about that yeah meditation on instagram not a big thing because i literally i'll do like uh yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I actually did a reel on Instagram recently of me meditating as a joke because it's the most boring thing in the world. <laughs> but it's not, is it? It's great. It's like, well said. it shows well how said. ADHD, I'm ADHD, so I take the mick out of it, how ADHD and like quick everything's become. And it's just like, yeah. so, you know, we've moved on with our, with our new, new age weird brains and we can't concentrate, let alone on advertising for, for such things. Yeah. Well, we can. It's just, again, social media and yeah. consumerism encourage us to do the opposite. Like, I think it would be so cool if, you know, a yoga festival said no yoga clothes. Like, come practice in your shorts, your T-shirts, your tank tops, your sweatpants. Like, come practice in stuff you already own that is not a yoga outfit. Like yeah, no stretchy right. yoga outfits. And it's actually, I know it's practical to have the yoga outfit. It's more comfortable. And, you know, for alignment, you can see the alignment better if you're the teacher. But, um, you know, we talked about plastic earlier and people are literally practicing in plastic with added chemicals. That's not good for us when you're hot and you're sweating. 
No, same as a yoga mat, right? Like you've got your face in this yoga mat and that's plastic. So I know I got rid of my big old black Cadillac uh, Manducas. You know, I had two of those huge Manducas forever. And uh, I think they were even called Eco or something. But um, yeah, they're just toxic PVC. They're like literally toxic. Yeah. The foundation yeah. of our yoga practice is toxic. Yeah, exactly. And you're not even connecting to the earth because, you know, that plastic stops you drawing the energy right. in. So yeah. the number of And I get you want grip, you know, but sometimes you can get grip on like hardwood and, yeah. you know, sometimes you can't. But. And also you don't have to do bajillions. It's also the type of yoga that we're used to practicing, right? Everyone like Hatha's original stay in homeostasis, blah, blah, blah. But now everyone wants to sweat. They want to push it. They want to keep. I know. So like your hands are going to sweat and down, move in down facing dog if you're doing down facing dog. But there's a bajillion asanas that you can practice. You don't just have to do that and show hungers. <laughs> yeah. So it's just interesting how yeah. the two became kind of fashionable, if you will, at once. Well, I think one of the awful things that happened in, in, in culture is that environmentalism and equity got separated because as we know, um, awful environmental crimes to societies and to, uh, nature often affect people of color or indigenous populations most directly and the hardest. And they have the least, um, uh, success or ability to for restitution mm. you know climate change is going to hit like countries like india uh where there's billions of folks who are poor and don't have a you know are are just a couple meals away from starving yeah. um the hardest so you know we really have to view i i hope that environmental responsibility within the yoga community can really become a, a hot new trend um <laughs> Yeah. Because I think that needs to be matched with equity, which I think thankfully has become much more a part of the yoga practice than in, in the, in the 2000s, it was every cover of yoga journal was, you know, a beautiful, conventionally beautiful, you know, media approved, beautiful white woman, not everyone. And to yoga journals credit, they tried different covers and people didn't buy them. So it's easy to blame yoga journal or media. People always blame media. People attack elephant you know, once in a while. And number one, we're like, well, it's one author in their opinion, like we're a community and we disagree. Yeah. I disagree with half the articles on elephant and I write about it. Um, but number two, it's on us. Like we write a lot about climate change and equity and wouldn't you know, people don't read it often. People want to read about, you know, relationships and trauma and narcissism and empath and all that may be important, particularly trauma to me, but, um, you know, what about the fate of the entire planet? I'm pretty sure that's going to be a traumatic event for pretty all big. of us. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that is really interesting. And I actually found something similar when I'm, when I'm talking about the, the human trafficking. You know, it's like right. people aren't that interested. So I interviewed Wim Hof yesterday. As soon as I posted about Wim Hof, everyone's on the posts. Posting about, and this isn't anyone's fault. It's an observation. Do you know what I mean? It's just. It is, yeah. And like, I, I'm, you know, on one hand, I'm pleased that everyone's going, okay, great. So Wim Hof, blah, blah, blah. And then they're probably buying tickets. Right. But at the other, on the other hand, I'm like, oh, you feel mother like, why weren't you picking up on all the other posts that I've been doing saying that people are being stolen as kids, you know, people being stolen from their homes, traffic, blah, blah, blah. But it's just such a weird blinkered vision that people have got about life. Yeah, it's they're interested. really weird. Like in America, we had the QAnon thing which is all focused on trafficking of children, but then, but it's kind of conspiracy realm yeah. talking. It's not actually doing anything that I've ever heard about. And then when you talk about the welfare of children, practically and politically, like Biden is trying to pass a, you know, pandemic relief bill that would cut child poverty, child poverty in half. And you don't see any re support from that. For, from the Republicans, and I'm not trying to get yeah. partisan particularly, but I also don't mind. And, you know, you're like, well, wait, I thought we cared about the children here, you know? Uh, yeah. And yeah, the Wim Hof thing, people are more excited about sitting in cold water than they are about equality or equity or, you know, climate change, which affects 
every level of existence or the fact that we're in the sixth extension, you know? So yeah, it's weird. Like sitting in cold water versus the fate of the planet and all humans and all animals. I think, you know, obviously sitting in cold water is way, way more exciting. Seeing cold water with an eccentric Dutch who is pretty entertaining, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not even insulting him, but it's No, like, no, I know you're not, mate. I'm just like, whack. I'm sort of just feeding yeah. what earth they could possibly be. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. completely out of whack, mate. It's completely out of whack. Everyone's in denial. Yeah. Cognitive dissonance is a huge high. So in terms of, you know, what's going yeah. on, what isn't going on. Yeah, and from a Buddhist point of view, it's, there's nothing evil about that. It's just that we're always looking for entertainment yep. because we're itchy. We have, like you said, ADHD. I think the entire human species at this point has been encouraged into ADHD by technology and by capitalism. And, and so we're just constantly like this. Yeah. And we can't slow down and relax. And yoga can help and meditation can help and eating real food, simple food can help. Yeah. And then we have this really painful, awkward vulnerability moment that we run away from. We turn on Netflix or scroll on Instagram, but if we don't run away from it, we actually might relax, be present. And that can be the ground of empathy and giving a care mm -hmm. and actually doing something. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be the day, mate. <laughs> yeah. That'll be the bloody day. Well, we can all do it, as you know. I mean, yeah. you do it in your practice. We all do it in bits, but that can actually be our path. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And taking people with us. Hi. So, um, just one little little thing about humor. Humor and spirituality, which for me yeah. is the absolute underpinning. I didn't know yeah. whether you had any light experience um, or story or you know, just an opinion that you'd like to share about humor, spirituality, wellness. Yeah. Um, you mean like a specific anecdote or a general? Just like, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something. Basically, like when I'm, if I'm teaching yoga or if I'm um, on a retreat or at an event or whatever, if, I, if I'm trying to convey a spiritual concept or a practice, if I, <laughs> there's no way on earth that I would either be able to learn something if I'm in a strict, serious situation or be able to tell something in a genuine, authentic way if there's not even a smattering of humor in there. And that's, of course, it's absolutely a devastating topic. But in terms of passing on information and things like that, um, and like the, the Dalai Lama speaks about humor and many other people do, and they say, you know, that it's an absolute integral part of being spiritual. I yeah. just don't know whether, where, where you think, you know, where your opinion falls on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I think there's sort of two different kinds of humor. One is making fun of people. Mm. It's kind of mean spirited, but the best humor, which is, I think every spiritual teacher you've ever seen who seems genuinely realized and not focused on creating a cult for themselves has a healthy sense of humor. Mm. And that humor fundamentally is the same as meditation. You're having perspective, you're having distance and perspective on your current situation. So if your current situation is good or bad, easy or hard, whatever it is, you can have a sense of perspective about it and kind of make fun of yourself lightly and the situation lightly. Not making fun of yourself in a mean way, which some of us do, as a way to always like put ourselves down, mm -hmm. but, and not making fun of others in a bullying way. But yeah, I think, enjoying i remember my 21st birthday I, I i wasn't even able to get the day off and i went to this i was in boston i went to this old irish pub on my way home it was right by my home and i went in and it was the first time i could legally drink and i ordered uh you know probably a guinness you know it was an irish pub and uh and this old guy who i never saw again he was like magical he came up and he said he like practically grabbed me and he said, enjoy life, enjoy life. And then he, I never saw him again. And that always stuck with me. It's like, on some basic level, whether it's equity or climate change or whatever we're passionate about, human trafficking, it's because we want everyone to have the opportunity to enjoy life. This life is beautiful, it's magical, it's, it's so amazing. And the fact that so many people 
and animals cannot enjoy life uh, is deeply upsetting and wrong. And so on some level, that humor or joy is, um, I also think, like you said, in teaching, it's a wonderful gateway for people. You see that with John Stewart. I wish he would unretire himself. People who can use humor to get people to care about important things and pay attention to important things. And um, I always say that's like elephant's fundamental challenge. The most important question in the world for all of us is how do you get people to pay attention to important things? And you just meant, you just observed that with the Wim Hof versus the other interviews. Like we have human trafficking going on, not as a conspiracy theory, but as a real thing. Mm. And it's so awful when you look at it, it's so awful. Yeah. I'm vegan, it's the same kind of level with that factory farming. If you actually looked at it, yeah. you know, you're gonna stop arguing about how bacon tastes good. You're gonna be like, okay, I may like meat and dairy, but this is wrong. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm gonna change my behavior at least significantly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, you clearly have a wonderful sense of humor and style, and you're doing good <laughs> stuff. So I'm, I'm so, I'm so uh, pleased to have got to meet you. Yeah, thanks, mate. It's lovely to speak to you, and um, yeah, it's been, it's been a great chat. Thanks very much, and thank you. Hopefully. Thank you for waiting for me to make my coffee. <laughs> That's all right. I completely understand. I had a, I had a, a ridiculous sized cup of tea. Look at that. Whoa. Yeah, mate. I don't know if that perspective is fooling with us, but that looks huge. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> and I like my um, my tea mugs and <laughs> my tea mugs oh, and my right. nails and my hair must all match. Oh look, yeah, always <laughs> love it, love it. Yeah. That's a really cute little mug. It is. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, and anything we can do to support. Thanks, mate. Brilliant. Love your face. Heart Stay in touch. Mwah. Loads of love, mate. Take care. Bye, love.